is going to take is desire. And uh, when I speak to desire, I speak about you know the work that comes from uh, the work that comes when you're trying to achieve a goal. And uh, you know goals aren't easily achieved. Uh, a lot of people have an idea that they want to become something. So, for instance, I wanted to become an Olympian. I wanted to win a briar. I wanted to be successful in what I wanted to be successful in in life. So I set goals for myself. I'm probably very similar to the goals you've set. How many of you have set goals to? Uh, go to university and be and be something in university. A set a set field. Okay. Do you have now? Do you have an idea on how you're going to get to that path? A lot of people set the goal that they're going to do something. Very few people actually set the path in which they're going to make to, uh, take to get to that goal. Um, and I know a lot of you will probably think that I'm that I'm nuts in in the way I'm saying this, but. Um, if you have if you have an end goal, which is whatever the case may be, whether yours is to win an Olympics, whether yours is to be a doctor or a teacher, there has to be a path in which you're going to follow to get to that destination. Um, I set our team when we when we formed ourselves, we formed about just over two, just under two years ago, and when we sat down together, we basically came up with an idea on how we're going to win the briar and become the number one team in the world and win the Olympics. And very few people uh, gave us any chance of that being successful, or us being successful in that goal. So what we did is the four of us sat down and we planned this out step by step by step by step every single day. Um, so when we started training in July of 2013 for the Olympics, we set what we were gonna do every single day. So we knew that we were gonna be in the gym two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening. We knew that we were gonna be on the practice ice as soon as we had it. We also knew that we were gonna spend time actually making ourselves believe in our own goal and our own dream. Because I'll tell you one thing, doubt will kill more dreams than failure ever will. And I'll say that again, and I want you guys to take that with you. Doubt will kill more dreams than failure ever will. It's that little voice inside your head that'll tell you you can't do something or you're not good enough to do something, or someone else is better than you, so why shouldn't they achieve what you want? Um, so we spent a lot of time focusing on not only the path on how to get there, which was the hard work that came with it, but also the mental side of it, which was preparing ourselves to do something extraordinary when a lot of people didn't necessarily think we had the chance of doing so. So like I said, we started we started this path and we, we started um, training uh, two hours a day every day. Ryan and I would be at the gym at six in the morning, every morning, rain or shine, whether it was a blizzard outside, no matter what. We would also be at practice at noon as a team and then we would be back at the gym at 6 p.m. This time I was with Brad. And we did that every single day. And a lot of you might think that that's not a whole lot uh, being that you know, um, you know, it's only three or four hours a day at the gym and a couple hours in the practice sites. But when you take into effect or take into account the fact that we all have families, we all have jobs, we all have personal lives. Um, our days were starting at 6 a.m. and ending at around 11, 12 a.m. So we were getting six hours sleep, um, and that's something that you have to be prepared to do if you want to achieve anything bigger than what uh, bigger than what you are, because you have to be prepared to not sleep, and you have to be prepared to miss out on a few parties and miss out on a few activities that some of your friends might be doing because you want something more than what they want. I'll tell you something from my past. Um, I grew up, and how many of you here know Mark Kennedy, he coached here so you should, Carter Rycroft, <laughs> Carter Rycroft, Scott Pfeiffer, um, all these guys that I grew up, I grew up playing against the best, the best of the best, John Morris, Brett Lang, uh, Craig Saville, all these guys I grew up, and when I was a kid I was always pissed off, I was pissed off that these guys were always winning more than I was. They were, they, you know, Scott Pfeiffer beat me in, beat me in a Canadian Juniors. Um, you know, John Morris beat me in a Canadian Juniors. Countless cash spiels. And I always wondered why they got so lucky. Why was it that these guys got to win and I didn't get to win? I thought it was my God-given right. My dad, I was a pedigree. My dad won the briar. I deserve this, right? I deserve to win. And eventually I realized that it wasn't the fact that these guys were luckier than me. It wasn't the fact that they deserved it more than I did. The fact of the matter was is they put more work into it than I did, far more. I made excuses continuously growing up. Um, 
you know, whether it was in school, uh, practicing through, practicing through uh, university, um, whether it was going to the gym, I didn't do anything, continually made excuses, would rather go out and party with my buddies and, and uh, you know, just hope that things happen the way I wanted them to happen. And they didn't, they didn't. I lost and lost and lost going into, now I'm, now I'm 23, 24, 25, still losing some success, but never taking that next step to the next level to achieve what I wanted to achieve. So I went from Manitoba playing with Jeff Stoughton, one of the best players in the world, didn't work out. Most people would be excited to be playing with a guy with that sort of history and reputation. It didn't work out for me because I wasn't prepared to work, put the work in there. And I always, at that time, blamed it on my team. I said, you know what? You guys aren't good enough for me. I deserve more. I'm gonna move teams. So I picked up, left Manitoba, left my family, my friends, my job, everything, got in my car, packed everything, excited to go to Newfoundland, play with Brad Gushu, another one of the top players in the game, and I did the same thing. I got there and I put a little bit more work into the game and a little bit more effort, but still couldn't look at myself in the mirror at the end of each season and say, you know what, I did absolutely everything I could possibly do to achieve the goals I wanted to achieve. Um, and that's something you all need to do, again, is take that one word of advice is that if you can look at the mirror at any given goal that you have and say that you've put every last bit of energy you've got into something, I will guarantee you 100% that you'll be successful and achieve that goal. So again, I started in Newfoundland, still not putting the work in. And then again, it came to, it came to pass that I got called into a meeting and uh, Brad sat me down and he's like, you know, things aren't working. And again, I blamed it on him because he, he made, you know, he's known for breaking up with teams and ditching his players and stuff like that. So I figured I was just one of those guys and didn't really take ownership of it on my own. So then after that happened, I had a little bit of an epiphany. I was sitting in a house that I paid for, for Adam and Jeff to live in. Um, and I was sitting there, I had no team, I had no job, no friends, no family. And I was sitting in an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. No idea what I was gonna do. So I started, I picked myself up and started realizing that if I wanted to get what I wanted to get, I had to start putting some work into this. So I called Brad uh, Jacobs and EJ and Ryan, and I came up with a plan on how we were gonna try and make this team a successful team. And they bought in 100%. So from that point forward, there was nothing about my life that I wasn't focused on getting what I wanted to get. And I was prepared to do whatever it took. And I mean whatever it took. I sacrificed job, I sacrificed everything, and I moved to a town of 75,000 people where I did not know a soul and barely knew the team I was playing with, but knew that I had a desire in me to achieve something that a lot of people don't get to achieve. And we formulated this plan, and I guarantee you right now that that gold medal is strictly because I made that one decision and changed my life in a positive way. It's all it took was one change of the course of my life to stop being lazy and stop looking for excuses and stop being pro and start being proactive and start making the right choices in life. So I started doing that and it's amazing how much luck started coming my way. How much how many wins started coming my way. All these things. Since we formed this team, we played 260 games, we've lost 39 of them. That's all we've lost since we started playing together. And that is remarkable. We went on a run of winning 45 games in a row, which led us through to the Olympics, which led us through, we ended up losing a couple in the Olympics, which was kind of sketchy there for a little bit, but um, you know, we, we were able to achieve that. And, and I'm, I couldn't be prouder of myself because I'm able to say that for one time in my life, I stopped looking for excuses and started being the man I wanted to be and stood up on my own and took you know, life by, from what it had to offer me and did it on my own. So we, we won, we got to go to the Olympics. Now a whole different slew of things came our way. Now we started, you know, we started getting a little bit cocky again. Um, you know, we still put the work in, but we, you know, we started, we looked at, you know, everyone was talking to us, every, all the media, you know, we're going on TSN, we're going on Sportsnet, everyone's like, oh, you guys are the greatest team, you're so fit, you put us in the world. Yeah, shit, yeah, we're awesome. You know, we're, we're going to take this, we're going to take this Olympics down, no problem. Um, and then reality kicked in. 
and then the weight of Canada kicked in and we started realizing that we didn't put as much effort as we did in the first two years together and as all we had to do was carry that forward to the Olympics and we would have been fine. But we kind of took a break. Simple, one month break, 30 days, nothing in the scheme of things. And we got there, the pressure started getting to us, we kind of got off, we started to stop depending on one another, we stopped putting in the mental work, we were still doing all the physical stuff, but the mental side of where you're focusing and believing in yourself in that little quote I gave you about how doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will, that was just pulsating in the back of my head. And I did not know how to get rid of it. So we went, we barely squeaked through our game with Germany. And I'm telling you, barely squeaked through this game. Against, honestly, any four of you guys could put together a team and you probably would have beaten us that game. That's how bad Germany was against us. So, and then we went and we lost to Switzerland and Sweden. And those were two pretty good teams, but not the best teams in the field. Now we're sitting there and you go through, in, in the Olympics, you are basically cattle. You get out, you get out of the, you get off the game and you get just walked through this media circuit and it is large. It takes a half hour to 45 minutes to get through this thing. And everyone was asking us, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you, Ryan? I don't see the same glimmer in your eye. What's wrong with you, Brad? Like, where's that eye of frost? There's all this, all this, these stupid things that they made up for us. They were all just barreling down and asking questions. Then we go on Twitter and it seemed like Canada turned, the entirety of Canada turned against us. So we started reading all that stuff. And to the point where it got us pissed off. We're like, we sat down with Paul Webster and Rick Lang, who are our two coaches, Tom Coulterman too. Um, we sat down with these guys and me and Brad and EJ and Ryan got pissed off. We're like, who the hell do we think we are failing in the biggest stage because we're too proud to get over ourselves and start doing the things that we needed to do. So we sat down together and formulated the plan the same way we did when we just started this team. And we're like, this is what we need to do. And if we do this, we'll roll the table and win the Olympics, 100%. So we did that. We came together. We had our team meeting. We made every little promise to one another that we possibly could. And you know what we started doing? We started budgeting for the bullshit. Do you know what that means? Does anyone get an idea what that means? And, I, and this is another thing I want you to take with you, is budgeting for the bullshit. That means every single day, somebody is gonna throw something your way that's gonna take away your inspiration, it's gonna take away your dreams, it's gonna, it's, you know, it's whether it's, whether it's your parents, you know, giving you hell for something, whether it's your friend trying to get you to go for a beer, whether it's whatever the case may be, there's a little bit of bullshit every single day that you have to budget for. And we started doing that. We knew that people were gonna come at us and tell us that we weren't good enough to win and we were too young and, you know, Kevin Martin should have been the representative or Russ How or Glenn Howard should have been the representative. So we started budgeting for all this and we made, stopped making excuses and prepared ourselves. So we took every day as it comes, the same way we took every day in the trials and every day leading up to that. And you know what kind of came of it again? Success. And it's bizarre that when you make these decisions to do so, that these things can happen. It's, it's absolutely bizarre to me because I was always the one who was the negative side of things. I was always the pessimist, thinking that things were always half empty instead of half full, I started going the opposite way. And it's amazing how much, how many good things came our way. And I'm telling you one thing, I'll never change back. I am, when we won, the first thing our team came, did when we got back after, you know, a little bit of partying, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we sat down and we formulated the next four years and we formulated how we're going to achieve the next set of goals, which is continue to be number one in the world, which is continue to win the Briar, which is continue to, yeah, make, set ourselves up to win in 2018 in Pyeongchang. And I think some of you who are here last year, you'll know how serious I am when I talk about this, when I say that we're gonna do everything we possibly can to win, because I guarantee you that we are gonna work our butts off to achieve this goal. I've got a couple of videos that I'm gonna show and I'm gonna talk in between the two of them. So 